Hey guys, Matt, Iron Trap Garage, and today we're going to do an entry in our Hot Rodding 101 series where we give you some information about different things regarding hot rodding and old cars and lessons that we've learned the hard way and hopefully will help you if you are new to hot rodding or maybe you've been in this for a while and maybe we can share some tips between what I tell you and also in the comments we always get a good discussion going with uh, guys and gals that have been doing this a lot longer than we have. So today's topic is flathead engines, Ford flatheads specifically, running hot. That seems to be something that since I got into very heavily into hot rods and, and flathead V8 specifically, that a lot of guys just talk negatively about flatheads. Oh, they all run hot. You can't take them anywhere, blah, 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 all those different things. And over the years, we've had a lot of good experiences and bad experiences and learned a lot about these engines and I've learned a lot of stuff the hard way. So I'm gonna share some things that I've kind of found over the past handful of years, and uh, they might be stuff to look at. If you have a flathead that's running hot, some of these tips might be something to look at. Even if you have a vehicle you drive all the time, but it runs a little on the hot side, there might be a couple of things you can try that we're gonna have in this discussion that might help you. So let's get started. All right, so number one thing, thermostats, no thermostats, restrictors, what do we do? A big discussion on that, there are lots, of, lots of argument, a lot of things that people say work or don't work. I'll share my experiences of what I've found. So number one, thermostats can be a good thing for sure if you have thermostats that fit correctly and work correctly. The number one thing that I've found when people use thermostats on flatheads, um, that maybe if you come from an overhead valve engine background, is people oftentimes put a thermostat that has an open, opening temperature that is too high um, for a flathead. A lot of times what happens, especially on hot rods when you're running something with a smaller radiator or chopped or a mechanical fan, you need every advantage you can get. So if you get a thermostat that is 180, 190, where it opens, that means your engine's always gonna be running at that 180, 190. And really that's kind of like the high end of where I like a flathead to run because you need that room for uh, temperature change if you get caught in traffic or it's a really hot day. So if your engine on a, normal day or a fall day is running 180, 190, and you get in 100 degree weather, you get caught in some traffic coming into a car show, you're gonna already be at 180, 190. That doesn't give you a lot of room for change that you're gonna be overheating. And when you have mechanical fans, small radiators, different things like that, you can have that problem. So a lot of times I've found just by, if you are running thermostats to change over to something that has a low uh, opening temperature, like a 160 or something like that, will definitely help you. That way it'll help the engine get up the temperature to that 160 range, which is a good spot to be. And if, it, if your car running down the road is running 170, 180, something like that, that's really good. And then if you get caught in some traffic, if it's at that range, that gives you 20, 30 degrees that you have for your kind of rise in temperature to come back down. And your thermostat's not holding you at that hotter temperature. Um, so that's one thing I found. Now restrictors. I think the restrictors are definitely a good thing versus a thermostat. Um, a lot of my cars personally, I either run no thermostats at all, or I run a little restrictor. So you can run a washer. The kind of old timey trick to do is put washers with like a five eighths or three quarter inch hole in the center of them and either weld them or tack them or something into the, um, where the water comes out of your cylinder heads, whether it's in the front or the back, or you can put them like in the hose or in the neck somewhere. If you have like those chrome tubes that they sell that are steel, you can tack weld some washers in there and keep some going. Um, one thing you have to be careful of, both with some of the aftermarket thermostats and also those restrictor plates or washers, is make sure you get a good tight fit. If they flip in the tube, I had it actually happen on this car here, where I had, used to run thermostats, and one of them flipped in the hose on me when I was driving it on the highway. And luckily I have dual gauges on this and I saw the one side cylinder head was like overheating, other side was running normal. Was able to limp it home and found that the one thermostat had flipped and was blocking three quarters of the coolant that was going in and out of that side of the engine, which is not good. So um, I think if you have a radio that is working properly, um, no thermostats on these cars seems to work okay. Um, I think Generally, I haven't found, and now there might be people that have found otherwise, if you run no thermostats, it's not really an issue. If your car's tuned correctly and everything's running right, running down the highway, the only bad thing that could potentially happen is your car might run a little too cool in the spring, in the fall, in the colder temperatures, if you're like us, where you actually get 
a lot of swing in temperatures over the year, that could be a problem. But find a thing that works best for you. But the number one thing is regarding the whole thermostat and cooling system uh, restrictions is make sure that you're not getting something that opens at too high of a temperature or something that fits poorly and is going to block the uh, coolant flow going through your engine. All right, so our second thing we're gonna talk about is cleaning your cooling system. Remember that most, well, all the Ford flatheads pretty much that you're gonna be messing with are anywhere from like 70 some years all the way up to 90 some years old. And they're going to have rust in them. They're going to have debris. If you're finding engines in barns and old garages like we are, they're gonna find mouse nests. You're gonna find all kinds of things that could be in your cooling system. A lot of times people complain about flatheads overheating and they have a car that is 70 years old and the cooling system has never really been flushed and they have, even if you find a whole vehicle, the cooling system will have rust in it. The radiator is going to have rust and, and debris and things blocking it. So anytime I get an old vehicle that we're trying to get back on the road, the number one thing you for sure want to do is flush out the whole entire cooling system. So get your radiator out, see if you can flush it out with some hot water or, or uh, just in general any water. If you can get a pressure washer in there and kind of shoot some stuff out that's really good. Um, on the engine side, if the engine is in the car and you don't want to take the heads and everything off, trying to blow some compressed air through the cooling system with all the hoses removed or putting water in there and back flushing it as much as you can is very helpful. Now, if you're building a car and you have the flathead out of the vehicle, the, the thing that I've found is the mo by far the most effective. And I've even done it in some of the cars, like this car used to run relatively warm when I would drive around. It wouldn't necessarily overheat, but I always was always worried about it. And what I ended up doing is if you pull the cylinder heads off, I know it sucks, and pull the water pumps off, you can get in there with air. So I will drain the cooling system out, let it completely dry so that it's fully you know, there's no moisture in there as little as possible. And then get in there with an air nozzle and blow as much as you can, because when it dries up, then everything kind of turns to a dust and the particles and everything, you can kind of blow out of there. So a lot of times what we'll do is we'll take an air nozzle, take a piece of like brake line that's, you know, that you can bend and put a long piece of brake line and you can shove it in all the different openings in the block, blow all the rust out, do it outside, because it is going to make a giant mess everywhere. Make sure you're wearing eye protection too because it'll end up going in your eyes for sure. Um, and blow it just between back and forth, you know, start in the front and do it at the water pump uh, holes and blow through and then come down all these holes and blow around and you can get a light in there. And usually you'll be very surprised if you put a light in from like the end of the water pump side, you'll see like chunks of rust. You're gonna see some of that leftover like sand and slag from the casting process when these were all being made and uh, you're gonna work that out of there. But with having that long tube, you can kind of get in there and scrape and push everything out. And a lot of times we'll spend anywhere from half an hour to an hour on each side of the block because flatheads, remember, have basically like two cooling systems inside of them. So you're gonna be working back and forth, back and forth and get them all blown out. Once you get everything blown out, you can then use you know, a pressure washer or use your hose and try and flush it out additionally. But I found when doing it dry, that is the biggest help. I've had a lot of vehicles um, that we've messed with where they were running kind of warm and that made a huge difference because you had all that rust that's just floating around and getting in your cooling system. This car was a good example. Rebuild engine, record radiator was still running warm for me and after I got rid of my thermostat issue uh, it was still running warm and I ended up pulling the heads, flushing the block multiple times, flushing the radiator, it was really good. So make sure if you're using an old radiator, you're getting it flushed. If you have an old time radiator shop in your area, take it to them, get them to, to kind of clean it out for you if possible. But at the very least, definitely do some cleaning yourself. If you see any signs of mouse nest, you need to do double as much time flushing everything because the little mouse turds and nests get everywhere. And if you remember with the, like the stroll car we had, <laughs> even though it's an old, the, the nest will break loose and start making it running hot um, when you least expect it. Now, you definitely can go through, um, as far as radiators go, um, the stock radiators work quite well if they are clean. Obviously, a new aluminum radiator will work great, but if you're doing a nostalgia thing, these old radiators actually work pretty well, and you can clean everything out, and it will work just fine. All right, so next couple things we're going to talk about are just sort of the parts that are bolted to your cooling system and what you're using in your cooling system. So 
Uh, radiator caps is a big discussion I've always seen over the years. People talking about pressurized, non-pressurized. Factory on a lot of the early cars, especially like 32 into maybe the 40s, um, they were basically a non-pressurized system. And the radiator cap, basically you, you start your car up, you run it after filling your coolant, and the car will just puke out coolant until it finds its happy level that is good. Um, on later cars, they kind of figured out that if they raise the pressure in the system, it kind of raises the boiling uh, point and will also help your water coolant from boiling at a lower temperature. So or with the uh, versus the stock caps. So that's one thing that's kind of a personal preference. Most of my cars for nostalgia's sake, I run an original type like 32 radiator cap. They work just fine. You just have to re realize that you're either going to put a little recovery bottle or you're gonna have a hose that runs down and it's gonna puke out the first couple of times you drive till it kind of finds its happy point and then it'll basically be fine and you won't have to worry about like a normal vehicle. Now as far as the coolant that you run, I really, um, back in the day, a lot of people just ran straight water. No problem if you're in a climate that you can get away with that. Um, but it does cause a lot of rust and corrosion in the engines. This is one of the reasons you'll see so much rust inside of a flathead, like when we were talking about cleaning. Because a lot of people didn't care, they just put their hose in it, filled it up, topped it off, drove it, and who cares. But it does cause a lot of rust if you run straight water. It's definitely good to run some sort of actual coolant in it. There's a lot of people that talk about like the Evans waterless um, coolant and all these different types of aftermarket coolants that are the next best thing. While they may work well, um, one thing that I've noticed in some friends that have used some of those is they, they tend to seem to find every possible leak or potential place that they could leak on an engine, they will leak. I don't know why, I don't know if it's how viscous it is or something, um, but I've seen a lot of times where water pumps will start leaking, hoses that never used to leak will leak, uh, head studs will start to leak and things like that. For me, I just like simple, uh, normal, plain old green, um, concentrate coolant works great for me. Just buy it. We pre-mix it ourselves. We obviously have winter time here in the East Coast in Pennsylvania, um, and we have to just mix it so that we make sure it's good for colder climates. But otherwise, just regular old coolant will work. It has um, some corrosion protection that's built into the coolant, which is why it's really good to run that versus just straight water. I have had some success using like water wetter or some of those additives that actually, again, kind of lowers the, the um, or raises the boiling point of the coin or water. That works best with straight water, but you can get away with adding a little bit to the coin. I have actually seen a notice in the temperature, but because of the cost, a lot of times, if you get everything else right with the engine, you don't really need to add that stuff, I guess, for drag racing and different things where the engine is really high performance, it is a problem, but on most street cars, I think if you get everything just right um, with your tuning and your cooling system and cleaning it, you really won't have an issue. All right, I talked a little bit about radiator uh, cooling fan. That's another thing that we're gonna get into here is, uh, I'll just touch again on the radiator, stock radiator, aluminum radiator, whatever you wanna run, they all work fine. It is kind of a known thing that the modern aluminum radiators probably are superior, probably, are superior um, for cooling the engine. But I think a lot of times when people swap to an aluminum radiator, really what they're doing is they're just getting rid of an old stock brass radiator that probably would have worked fine when it was new, but it was old and clogged or had leaks and things like that. And that's why the aluminum radiator seems so much better. A lot of times I found when I get a radiator redone with a you know original style with a copper or brass you know radiator, they work just fine if you get a new core put in them or you get them cleaned and all the leaks fixed. They work just fine and there's not an issue. So you make that decision yourself. Lunar radiator, you definitely can't go wrong. They definitely are affordable uh, compared to getting uh, original type radiator record. But if you're going to for the nostalgia and the look, I prefer to take original radiators, use those tanks, have them record. If you're lucky enough to have a shop around you, you can do that. That's definitely a nice thing. Otherwise, if you can, you know, if you're worried about the color, you can just obviously paint them black and you will get by just fine with an aluminum radiator. Now fans, again, this is a nostalgia or personal preference thing. There is no argument that an electric fan with a good shroud is going to outcool a standard just mechanical fan that's on the front of your engine like a flathead came with originally. So if you're not worried about, again, the nostalgia side of things, definitely run one of those. It's gonna help you. If you put that on, kind of like the thermostat idea, if you get the fan that it kicks on it, like 
180 or 185 or 190 and then drops your, your temperature back down, you're gonna be really, really good. You can drive the thing probably in any type of climate and not have a problem at all. But if you're really picky about the nostalgia side of things, obviously you're gonna to wanna to run a mechanical type fan and you need to do everything you can to get that fan to run as efficiently as possible. So number one, as big of a fan as you can get. So on a lot of these cars that are chopped, channeled, sectioned, everything's been changed, the radiator has to be shrunk down and you will need to make the, the radiator uh, fan as smaller just for the, the size of the area that you're in. Um, but one thing to do is make sure that that fan is as big as it can be if you're cutting it down. Get everything really close so that it fits in there and you're getting as much of a fan as possible. If you're using a stock type setup, get a, a larger fan. Some of the flathead models like trucks and things like that got fans that actually had additional blades in them. They will definitely help. Um, a four blade fan is going to cool more than a three blade and six blade fans and obviously do better than a four blade. So that's something to look for. That's a cool little upgrade you can do is if you can find one of those fans out of a truck or something like that, it'll get a little more cooling. Another thing I've noticed that when people are building hot rods and from scratch or they're moving the radiator around and things like that is having your mechanical fan close to the radiator. I've seen where you put, you know, there's a gap and even in some of my own cars I've found over the years that I've made the radiator too far from the fan and it's not working as efficiently as possible. So if you ever look at a stock fan, that's what kind of got me thinking on this in the recent years, if you look at the stock fan on say a 34 Ford or 39 or 40 Ford, the fan is really close to the radiator. I mean, you could probably barely get your hand between the fan blades and the radiator itself. So if you have a fan that's got six inches between the fan and the radiator, by the time it's pulling the air through, it's not really doing a lot. So you can do the test with a piece of paper, put it in front of your radiator while the car is idling. If the mechanical fan is holding the paper again, it's paper against the radiator while it's idling, it's probably working pretty well. If it does not, you may want to think about getting your fan out a little closer to the radiator so it's helping when you're sitting, when you're running at low speeds or you're sitting idling. All right, our next thing is we're going to get into engine tuning. One thing with a flathead, they have a kind of poor design with the center cylinder having the coolant kind of go around the combustion chamber there and it will tend to, if the engine is not running correctly, superheat the coolant as it goes through and around that. A flathead especially is much more picky with how it's running as far as the fuel mixture goes versus some uh, overhead valve engine or something like that. Because of the way the coolant routes, if you have a cylinder pressure or cylinder temperature that is higher than it should be, it is going to transfer directly right into your cooling system and you will see a gauge. So if you're driving your flathead down the road and you see that the gauge is generally going up, going up, going up, the more you drive it, or if you notice that say at the highway at high RPMs, your temperatures kind of go up and it will continue to creep up until it's basically overheating or running really hot versus when you're running around town at lower RPMs, the thing might run a little cooler. That could be because your, your mixture is not quite right. So definitely having a, mechanic, a mechanical gauge that works correctly, or having a gauge in general that works correctly. So you can watch that temperature fluctuation is really important. Obviously you can read your plugs, see what they're doing. I found, at least in my experience, that with flatheads they tend to read the plugs a little differently than you would your Honda Civic or something like that. So you may want your plugs a little more on the black kind of rich side than you would with a modern car where you may want it more on the brown side. Um, you can actually get your car to run a little cooler um, by maybe making it a little more rich. So especially with most of us with our flatheads, we're hopping them up. So by putting your carburetors on, you may need to adjust the jet size to get it so that it runs at a happy spot. So you're gonna balance between coolant temperature, engine performance, fuel consumption, all of that stuff. Obviously, if you're running down the road at the highway and you're belching black smoke out the back side of your tailpipe, probably running a little rich. But if you're not smoking and you're running down the road and it might feel a little sluggish, or again, if you see that your engine temperatures are running a little hot, kind of like steady. It's not like it's constantly going hot, but it's running on the hot side. It could be that your mixture is not quite right. So by having a handful of jets that you can play with is really helpful in checking that out. So you can basically take your carbs off, go up one jet size, take it for a drive, kind of same type of drive, and notice what your temperatures are doing. Is the car now running 
five or 10 degrees cooler with changing the jet size, but the power of the engine feels the same where it's not blowing black smoke out. That's making your engine probably a little more happy getting the, the temperatures at a better point. And it's kind of my crude way of figuring it out to get the engine at the happy point where you're not running as hot and your engine's running good, you read the plugs and all that different stuff. So there's a combination of all that, but that's something to check. If you kind of went over everything else with making sure your cooling system's clean and, and ignition and everything else, but you may want to check that mixture and just see what you're doing. And just by playing with some jets, it's something that you can just swap out. It's easily, you know, you can easily change it back by going up one jet size. You may find that the engine runs a little cooler and runs a little better. Another thing regarding fuel, the fuel side of things is make sure that you're checking your fuel pressure. So if you have an electric pump on your vehicle or even a mechanical pump, if you are running something that has lower pressure or even volume than the carburetors of the engine are requiring, you might end up going into a point where you have a low uh, pressure or your carbs are starving, um, or if your float level is not set correctly, which is a kind of an obvious thing, but should in the same discussion, by having low uh, fuel pressure or low float level, you're kind of starving the carburetors in the engine of fuel, which is gonna make it run a little hot. One thing I've had happen to me in the past, like with my Mercury, so we put an old Winfield cam in it, drove the car around for a while and it ran okay. It was running a little warm. Sometimes you're driving it you know, on the highway or, or you know, higher RPMs for a long period of time. And I would notice the thing would kind of creep and run a little hot. And um, after a while, one day the, the thing wouldn't start. And I found out that I had no fuel pressure while the lobe on the cam had worn so badly that basically it was the action of the fuel pump. It wasn't working the fuel pump. So instead of changing the cam on that car, I went to an electric fuel pump on there that runs at that low pressure, um, like one and a half to two and a half pounds that the flatheads or the uh, Strombergs, depending on the carburetor you're running, you may be different, but find that happy zone where it will run. So if you have a gauge, good to put a fuel pressure gauge on there, plumb it in line in between your carburetors and your fuel pump, take it for a drive, see what it's doing. If you're having something also that maybe a car is hard to start, that's another thing that was happening with my Mercury when it was cold and the engine was cranking, you would have to crank a whole bunch to get the fuel pressure built up to fire the engine because that fuel pressure volume was so low on it. And it was just because my fuel, my lobe had worn out on the cam and it was basically not moving the fuel pump enough to actually actuate it. So definitely check your fuel pressure, check your float level, make sure your float level is correct and you don't have it too low where you're starving your carburetors or you're running out when you're running at higher RPMs or wide open throttle. All right, next thing we're talking about is uh, kind of an obvious thing with any type of engine with overheating is checking your ignition timing, making sure that your advance is working on your distributor, um, making sure that your base timing is correctly. Now, some of the early flatheads, a lot of that, all the early flatheads, that is basically set up on a distributor machine. Majority of that stuff is already set up ahead of time. So that's good if you're getting a distributor, getting one that all that stuff's kind of set up and ahead of times. Now, if you have some of the aftermarket distributors or the APA style that you can actually turn things a little bit, much like a small block or an overhead valve engine. You could set your base timing, make sure that all that, that stuff's good and at your total advance, you're getting the right type of advance. If you're getting the wrong ignition timing on it, especially if it's retarded or something like that, or if too far advanced, if you're out of the range, you can have an engine that will run hot. Another thing is make sure that your plug gap and your plugs aren't crappy. You know, everything's firing and working correctly. This is just normal engine maintenance things, but sometimes it's something that people will look over and they will have plugs that are, you know, crappy, the gaps are way out, or the plugs are, are really dirty and things like that, making the engine not work as efficiently as it could. But mainly it's with the timing side of things. If you're getting the timing right on it and everything else is right, it should run great. It should run fairly cool. All right, last couple things are just little tips and tricks that may work for you or that I've done and other people have talked about and it seems to be a couple of good things. So number one, with water pumps, I found that over the years, most flathead water pumps, they don't really like go bad like a modern car. A lot of modern cars nowadays have like a plastic impeller on a metal shaft and they will kind of come unglued and, and, the, and the water pump will not work correctly. A lot of the flathead water pumps, we've had engines that were looked like they were drug out of the ocean and the water pump itself still spun fine. All the impeller blades were there, everything was good. Um, so 
water pumps as themselves, if they work fine and they flow coolant, they're probably working okay as long as none of the impeller blades are chipped and the shaft isn't loose or falling off or anything like that. Most times they are working just fine and you don't have to worry about that. But you can get some upgraded water pumps that definitely flow more coolant or water through your engine and they are definitely helpful. The big thing with a lot of the modern water pumps is they put a like bearing inside of them and the bushings and all of the sealing of them is better internally than what came on these originally with um, the original water pumps on this flatheads. A lot of times they tend to leak more than going bad. They will tend to leak out the front of them or out the side and you will have to replace them because of that. But the modern water pumps are going to flow more coolant, but I found that we have cars with stock type pumps that work completely fine, cool the engine fine. They worked way back when, they work just now. But if you have to get new water pumps regardless, it's not a bad thing. Now speaking of water pump impeller blades, there is a folklore old wives tale that people say, oh, cut the, every other blade off the impeller so the coolant doesn't move as fast. A lot of that stuff I think maybe it does something in theory, but I think if you have a good running engine and a cooling system that is working correctly, you don't need to do any of that nonsense. The coolant running too fast through the engine, if you have a running a radio that's working correctly and everything that's sized correctly, you, it really, I don't think it's something that is going to solve your problem. So before you go ripping your water pumps off and taking the cutoff grinder to the impeller, I would think you might want to look at some of the other stuff that we've covered already um, because I think that's more of an old wives tale that while it may in theory work, I don't think it's going, it's, it's going to solve your overheating problem. So getting water pumps that work correctly and don't leak is probably the most important thing. There's enough coolant in the system that if everything's working, you don't need to do any of these crazy tricks with the water pumps to make them work. Another tip or trick that, um, again, is back to the whole exhaust port, uh, with the whole center cylinder Siamese uh, exhaust port is opening up the exhaust um, openings on the block is definitely helpful. They are kind of small, sized and if you hold a gasket up to them you can see how much you can open them up that is definitely helpful by getting the exhaust gases out more quickly and not having any restriction you're going to help with the engine not building up heat in that area so that's a cool little trick if you're rebuilding your engines go in there and it's going to help with performance and also may in a small amount help with your cooling of the engine because you're not trapping all that heat in the exhaust when it's trying to get out especially when you have an engine that has multiple carburetors camshaft that's upgraded uh, and possibly bigger valves, et cetera, et cetera. So you wanna do something with your exhaust to kind of open it up, help get that heat and exhaust gases out of it. On the same thought with the exhaust is make sure that you don't have any type of re restrictions in your exhaust. So that could be an old exhaust on a barn find car that has a mouse nest in it, old muffler, something like that, that the pipes are blocked. Another thing that I've run into and made the mistake was putting in slip-in baffles that have like fiberglass around them like they use on motorcycles. I found that some of those baffles are very restrictive and can actually make your car run a little hot. I had that problem on the Schroll Coupe. I had put a slip-in baffle that you could add uh, optional fiberglass around them, uh, wrap them and put them in, and it would deaden the exhaust a little bit more. I tried it for a little while and I was finding that on the highway, it was running hot and I couldn't really figure out why. And finally, one day I decided to pull the uh, fiberglass off and put the baffle back in. The thing ran much cooler, probably up to 15, 20 degrees cooler. We we're running at higher RPMs because it was kind of blocking that exhaust before it was coming out. It was slowing everything up, backing it up, creating heat inside of the cooling system. So while it's not a flathead, same idea works with you know the flatheads. And again, they are more temperamental with things like that. Where on a overhead valve engine, you may get away with it. It just runs a little warmer. Your flathead might be melting to the ground at the highway uh, with the same type of restriction. So make sure that you're checking that. All right, so that's my top list for keeping your flathead cool. These are some of the problems and fixes that I've found over the years that have helped myself and also some of my friends uh, in keeping their flatheads running good and running cool. Now, of course, there's a lot of other things we could cover. We could go on and on and on about things that potentially could cause these issues like valve adjustment and things like that, but we're covering the most common things I've seen that helped with a flathead running cooler. So definitely, we'd love to hear down in the comments of like a lot of the Hot Rodding 101 videos. If you have some sort of solution, trick, thing you found, or just a great funny story about an overheating flathead, 
uh, like a mouse nest that you found in your cooling system or something, drop a comment down below. We'd love to hear it and continue the discussion after the video in the comment comments. Thanks guys for watching. Appreciate it. Catch you later.